funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Skillshare. Tune until the end of the video to find out how you can try Skillshare absolutely free. Yes, you heard me free. It's an amazing deal. You're going to love it. Okay, video time. And the Oscar goes to... Shrek. Spirited Away. Finding Nemo. The Incredible. Wallace and Gromit in The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Happy Feet. Ratatouille. Wally. Up. Toy Story 3. Rango. Brave. Frozen. Big, Big Hero, Hero 6. 6. Inside Out. Zootopia. Coco. Spider-Man. Spider huh. Those are all weird ways of pronouncing the Lego movie. Also, why did Paul Rudd look like Keanu Reeves in 2012? So yeah, the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, aka the LOL, we didn't watch any of these movies, just give it the Pixar Award. Sometimes the Academy gets this winner so right, sometimes it gets it oh so wrong. Ah! Obviously, not all Best Animated Features are created equal. So today, I figured I'd rank and review all 18 winners, as well as give my thoughts on whether or not I think they deserve the Oscar, and what movie should have won instead. Anyway, this is gonna be a long boy, so let's jump into it. Disappointment in the game of life! I'm gonna play you a brief clip that perfectly sums up the quality of the movie Brave. Here it is. Fortnite. I could stop there, but let's keep going. Brave sticks out like a sore thumb in the list of animated feature winners. I feel like you can make a case for any of them winning in their respective years, but Brave is such a boring, derivative mess. And I don't think there's any justification for it beating Wreck-It Ralph. Everyone disliked that. But forget about that, Brave is just really bad. It's a generic, dumb story with a boring, dumb protagonist couple with dumb side characters and no charm whatsoever. They copied Brother Bear. Brother Bear. Oh, I want the spell to change me mom. To paraphrase Will Smith, Genie, there is a lot of gray area in change me mom. I'll be your mommy. Ah! Merida is the worst Disney princess and Pixar protagonist by far. That includes Lightning McQueen, and Mater, and Dino Lad. This idiot constantly says it's not her fault that she turned her mother into a bear, while also getting no repercussions for that whatsoever. Even Disney hates her. What the f*** are you talking about? <laughs> Now that I'm thinking about it, this scene was probably shade since Brave beat the first Ralph movie at the Oscars. I mean, this movie is worse than Ralph Breaks the Internet, so I'll allow it. Turn around, you idiots! There's a bear behind you! Do you not hear it? She's clearly looking over and taking notes from someone! Turn around and see the bear! It also has some awful humor that you might find in a Z-tier DreamWorks movie, like when one of the toddlers jumps into a woman's bodacious bosom. Yeah, that was a thing. I think we can stop there, to be honest. <laughs> Happy Feet is astonishingly awful. <laughs> Revisiting it, I was genuinely shocked at what a complete embarrassment this entire film is. I liked it as a kid, but wow, not only does it not hold up, but it has some of the most annoying characters, nonsensical story beats, and least appealing animation I've seen in any mainstream animated film. My eyes! I guess I should start by being kinda nice. The song covers are good. I like Hugh Jackman's voice. Who doesn't? Sometimes the environments are really well animated and nice looking. And honestly, this movie is kind of saved by how utterly bonkers it is. But that's about it. The story bounces all over the place. First, it's about Mumble struggling to fit in since he can't sing and he loves dancing. And I thought, oh, that's nice. It's a commentary on societies that place a person's self-worth on one particular talent. Maybe this movie's alright. But then it stops being that and turns into a movie about alien abduction where the aliens are humans who leave tags and garbage on animals. Then it's suddenly about religious zealots who are racist towards outsider penguins with Mexican accents. Huh? Then they've got to get this choking penguin to the alien human so he can stop choking. Then it's suddenly about the environment and a commentary on overfishing, and it, it's too much. This movie just piles plot points and underdeveloped themes on top of each other with no rhyme or reason. The character design is garbage. I legitimately could not tell Mumble's girlfriend from his mother. These penguins all look the same and they are not expressive in the slightest. It made me miss the hyper-expressive horrifying designs of Shark Tail, if we're being honest. These Mexican stereotype sidekicks are some of the most annoying characters I've seen in any animated movie. To the point where I think I would have preferred five minions. I really mean that. The entire movie is also weirdly sexual, and it's not like one or two jokes here and there. It's like the entire purpose of a penguin's existence is finding a mate, and they do not shy away from the intimacies of that. At, 
I just, honestly, I have so much more to say, but I feel like this movie needs its own video. It's just so bad. This movie beat out Cars and Monster House for the Oscar, despite being the weakest of this particularly weak bunch. Even though DreamWorks had two perfectly good movies this year that went entirely ignored, I also can't believe George Miller won an Oscar for this, but he didn't get anything for Mad Max Fury Road. That movie won six Oscars, but none of them went to him. His contributions to Fury Road are not nearly as award-worthy as his work on one of the most scattershot, insane, genuinely terrible animated movies I've ever seen. But it's better than Brave because at least it's interesting. I'm sorry to start out so negative, but I didn't expect this to be as bad as it was. Let's move on before I lose my mind. Big Hero 6 is still indeed a movie. It's fine. I really like the opening, and I think it's a really compelling setup. But once Tadashi gets blowed up, everything kind of goes downhill. The superhero stuff is just really dull and uninteresting, and I forgot how much I hate TJ Miller in literally everything he's in. He's the comic relief in this, and I wanted him to die in every one of his scenes. I also still think the villain is dumb. So much of the movie's suspense hinges on its twist villain, but when it's the most predictable, obvious thing in the world, how do you expect me to stay invested? I will say, I like the contrast in how Hero and Callahan deal with grief, they both become okay with killing people because of how much their grief has consumed them, with Hiro realizing it's not what Tadashi would have wanted. The problem is that Callahan is so inexplicably bloodthirsty and one-dimensional that it's comical, wanting to avenge his daughter's death while not caring about killing everyone around him. Like, he's only mad at Cray, right? As Cosmonaut puts it, this is a full-on ERJB. Evil robot Jeff Bridges. His motivations don't make logical sense, but we gotta fight a supervillain who's destroying everything, so whatever, who cares. I will say, the one thing I love about this movie is Baymax. He's adorable and funny and huggable, but like, that's a given. Overall, I was kinda bored. The characters were lame, the superhero stuff was lame. I remember when I first watched this movie, right around the scene where they all attacked that pigeon, I just thought to myself, this company released The Incredibles, a movie that's better in every conceivable way 10 years ago. And yeah, that says it all, I think. Among the nominees that year, everyone I know says How to Train Your Dragon 2 was better. I haven't seen it yet, but you know what? I agree. Or at the very least, the winner should have been the Lego Movie, one of the best animated movies of the decade, which the Academy, in all their divine wisdom, didn't nominate. <sighs> that was their mistake! I've gone on record saying that Frozen is, in fact, a good movie. And like, yeah, I guess I still think that, but there's some real hot garbage in this one, honestly. Let's start with the good stuff. I really, really like Anna. She's spunky and funny and filled to the brim with personality. I love seeing her naivete about the world being tested over and over, and I also love her interactions with Kristoff. Their chemistry is <laughs> pitch perfect. It's Kristoff! Olaf is also really funny, honestly. He's very self-aware for a comic relief, and he has some great lines. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. Anytime these three share the screen, it's a blast. I also think half the songs are bangers. Let it go is... let it go. There's a reason it's so popular. It's great when you remove it from the context of the story, but I'll talk about that later. Love is an open door is a jam. I love the opening title song. For the first time in forever is solid, and the reprise is really good. Okay, that's all the good stuff that comes to mind. Half of these songs are real bad. I've always hated Do You Want to Build a Snowman. It's just annoying and terrible from a musical perspective. In Summer is... whatever. Ever. The Rock Troll song is atrocious and so tonally inappropriate given the context of the story. The Rock Trolls in general are pointless and stupid. You should never take something for granted. <laughs> I hate Hans as a twist villain, obviously. But I also hate the stupid red herring villain and his stupid chicken dance. Ugh. But far and away, my biggest issue with this movie is that Elsa is an awful character. This is such a huge issue for me that I cannot go into it here. I already have a full video planned for this topic. We'll get to it eventually. Bottom line is, this movie works, just barely, because the chemistry between our central threesome is so strong and I enjoy them together, but it's got a lot holding it back. I didn't watch The Wind Rises, but I'm gonna take a wild guess that it deserved the Oscar that year over Frozen. It's alright, moving on. Up is cute. I really like Up. But Up is not automatically a masterpiece based on the first 15 minutes alone. Once that's over, you're left with a decent kids movie, but not much else. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot to enjoy here. The score is probably the best of any Pixar movie. It's absolutely soaring and gorgeous to listen to. Doug is a really funny companion, and I laughed quite a few times at his jokes. And... I don't know, it's cute, like I said. The characters are fine, the journey's fine, everything's pretty much... 
fine. But this movie has always been overshadowed by its opening, and I wish people would stop doing that and just consider the movie as a whole. A lot of it is just kinda of fluff. It doesn't really have the same thematic cohesion as a lot of other Pixar movies, or hell, even Shrek 2. I don't know, I just don't really see the connection between the promise Carl made to take his wife to Paradise Falls and the promise he made to this random little kid to protect a giant bird creature. The villain is decently intimidating and he works for what he is, but he's nothing incredible. And neither is the movie, really. It's a good, enjoyable, family-friendly adventure, but that amazing opening promises so much more. And yeah, if you watched my video about 2009 and animation, I think you know which movie I believe deserved the Oscar this year. Fantastic Mr. Fox is, well, fantastic, and it's a little upsetting that the first Best Picture nomination for an animated movie in almost 20 years went to this instead of Wes Anderson's stop-motion masterwork. But you know, at least it's cute. <laughs> Finding Nemo is a good movie. That's really about it. It's never really been one of my favorite Pixar films. I mean, the underwater world is stunningly gorgeous, especially for 2003. And the character designs are great too. I forgot what good animated fish could look like. Thank you, Shark Tale. There's a lot of great emotional beats and character growth for Marlin and Nemo. And honestly, Marlin is really funny. Albert Brooks' delivery adds a ton to this character. But the thing is, I've never been a huge fan of Dory or the Tank Gang. Some scenes are kind of drab and uninteresting. There's more gross-out humor than I remember, which is a little jarring for Pixar and like, I don't know, it's just not as tightly made as some of their other movies. But it's good. Deserved its win against Brother Bear for sure. Yes, yeah, and moving on. Welcome to the zoo. Zoo, zoo. Zootopia is a cinematic disaster because at one point you can see these moles walking out of mousies, but they're clearly holding targoat bags. Zero out of ten, garbage movie. You should be ashamed of yourselves, Disney. No, but seriously, Zootopia is pretty good. I remember not being the biggest fan of it the first few times I watched it. I mean, the nudist colony scene was, um, not exactly my cup of tea. I found some of the action scenes pointless and tedious, especially the train battle at the end. I think this problem was heightened because the action kind of peaked with that rodent chase towards the beginning of the movie, and nothing else really topped it. Even though this is the best overall movie of the twist villain trilogy, it does have the worst twist villain. And overall, I thought the racial tension between prey and predators was kind of hit or miss. I guess they never Stop it! Sometimes it's really on the nose or bizarre to the point of being comical, like when Judy explains that only Bunny is can call other bunnies cute, but like, there are a ton of cute animals, it's not like you own that word. That was a little weird. But then there are other lines and exchanges that really strike a chord. Nick, stop it. You're not like them. Oh, there's a them now. Now that is powerful. Same thing when there's that mother on the train who brings her baby closer to her when there's a tiger next to them. Just small moments like that which really make me sad every time I see them, but in a good way. The racial tension stuff is mostly well handled, and I like how it's not a one-to-one -one allegory for the real world, but rather a good way to teach about the dangers of prejudice and stereotyping. It's also a really funny movie. Nick and Judy are great characters with a great dynamic, and I really like a lot of the side characters as well. I wish the story was a little tighter, that Shakira's song they keep playing is genuinely really bad, and overall I'm not really into anthropomorphic animal movies that much, but it's a really good movie, and of course I think Moana should have gotten the Oscar instead. That's my favorite Disney movie. I mean, come on! Hold it! Sorry, big fat wolf coming through. Time to add a little extra commentary to this. While I strongly disagree that Moana should have won the Oscar instead of Zootopia, I feel like that should clear up some things regarding to what James said. First of all, while I agree that Bellwether wasn't a good twist villain, she wasn't really a bad one either. <laughs> I mean, come on, I think there are other twist villains that are worse than her. Like, um... Johnson Smith and Johnson Smith and Corporate. Okay, fine, she was an awful twist villain, but I still like her regardless. Shut up. Try Everything wasn't really that bad either, but I sure can't tell the gloriousness that is the song Glorious from the cinematic masterpiece of 2017 that is Rock Dog. Also, regarding the whole thing about Judy saying that bunnies don't like being called cute, the directors of Zootopia, Brian Howard Rich Moore, once stated that they think it's more of Judy's personal preference, and I'm just gonna put the whole thing here since James told me to keep this commentary as brief as possible. Anyways, that's all I have to say. Feel free to disagree with me all you want, but I just felt like in is all out. Oh, wait, there was this uh, one thing I forgot to mention. <clears throat> These are not moles, James. They are, in fact, Arctic shrews. I know that part was clearly satirical, but still, do your f research on animals for once, you f piece of shit. When I first started this project, Rango was the only Best Animated Feature winner I had never seen before. And I have to say, I was really worried at first because the first half hour or so was kinda boring. I was not into the slow pace at all and Johnny Depp's voice was really starting to get on my nerves. I thought to myself, oh 
god, please don't tell me this is gonna be another happy feat. Fortunately, it wasn't. Despite its weak start, Rango really kicked itself in the high gear and became an incredibly engaging, mature, artistic western. The story isn't amazing, but what's really striking about this movie is the animation. With one exception, I think this movie has the best animation out of anything on this list. There is something so striking about the lighting, the textures, the character designs, and the environments that makes this such a visual treat. It's not laugh out loud funny, but there's a lot of quirky moments, to the point where the tone, coupled with the visuals, almost reminded me of a Wes Anderson film. And since there's no Wes Anderson films on this list, it's nice that I can at least talk about something of the same ilk. The other neat thing about this film is that it is decidedly not a kid's movie. There are so many guns and murder and mild swears and dark themes, and it's kind of refreshing to see a movie take the medium of animation and make something adult-oriented that isn't a full-on comedy. I don't think I would have liked this movie as a kid, but I'm glad I can enjoy it now. I like Kung Fu Panda 2, but I'm glad this movie won the Oscar. It's nice to see such a bold risk that mostly paid off being rewarded. I get the feeling I'm only going to appreciate this movie more and more with time. So maybe it'll find itself higher on this list in the future. Oh, that's a nice one. The granddaddy of all best animated feature winners. The one that started the whole thing. Let's pause for a moment of respect, shall we? That's enough. Hit it! <laughs> So Shrek is a good movie, despite what the memes and the merch and the spin-offs make you want to believe. Is it as good as Shrek 2? No, but it's got its own special charm to it. Despite its very 2001 sensibilities, I don't really find it all that dated. It skews fairy tales in a way that still holds up, but it tells a very emotional, mature love story that progresses pretty realistically. As realistically as a three-day love story between a princess and an ogre can be, anyway. Its sense of humor is very laid back and natural, in comparison to Shrek 2, which actively had a lot of jokes. Shrek 1 sees a lot of the humor come from the interactions and the way the actors deliver their lines. The casting for this movie still boggles my mind with how perfect it is, and the story ends in a very emotionally satisfying way. It's got a great message and a great way of delivering it. Did it deserve to be the first Best Animated Feature winner? I prefer Monsters, Inc. personally. It's one of my favorite Pixar movies, and I think it's better than Shrek by a fair portion. It's a little disappointing that this is DreamWorks' one and only animated feature win they got without Ardman's help, since DreamWorks has made much better movies since that had the misfortune of going up against Pixar in their prime. But Shrek is still a satisfying, if unconventional, start to this category's short and not-so-prestigious history. Check it out. It's fun. Or watch Shrek Retold. It might actually be better. TBH, don't at me. Body wants told. Out of all the movies on this list, Inside Out is the most, I can't remember if this is a good movie or a bad movie since it's been forever since I've seen it and I now know it has glaring problems movie on this list. And yeah, I don't normally care about plot holes that much, but this movie has some really bad ones. Why don't you send the core memories to headquarters with the memory sucky thing they use to send the gum commercial up? Why do you need to wake up Riley? You yourself said nothing bad can happen while she's asleep. Just wait it out on the train, you impatient fools. The amount of conveniences and contrivances to make this journey as long as possible is kind of ridiculous. So with all that being said, I adore this movie. Who cares about contrivances when they allow for some of the most whimsical, creative concepts I've ever seen in a movie? There's this film set where they make Riley's dreams. There's an abstract thought room where everyone becomes non-figurative. Joy makes a ladder of imaginary boyfriends so she can reach a trampoline, grab sadness from atop a rain cloud, and land on a window. <laughs> this movie is just an overload of creativity that's really more about the journey than the destination. I remember the first time I saw this movie, I cried during the opening. Yeah, that's right, the opening. Just the very concept of these emotions growing up with Riley and sticking with her through all the good and bad times got me really, well, emotional. The characters are all really expressive and funny, which is owed to the great casting, animation, and writing. I love Bing Bong, Fear, Anger, Sadness, The Green One, and especially Joy. She's one of my favorite Pixar protagonists by far. I love the personal growth that she goes through by realizing the importance of sadness. I love how well set up the conclusion is, showcasing Joy's attempts to cheer Bing Bong up or wake Riley up through sheer happiness, only for sadness to showcase the importance of negative emotions. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to not be happy all the time. Emotions are complex and often interwoven in bleh, often interwoven in ways that seem contradictory. And this movie understands and expresses that in the most subtle, mature way possible. God, this is such a good movie. I think the plot holes are valid in this one and hold it back from being a true masterpiece, but I love it nonetheless. 
So did it deserve the Oscar? Nope, not really. Inside Out is great, but come on. Anomalisa is an actual masterpiece. If you haven't seen it, please seek it out. It's a transcendent cinematic experience. This is just a really great Pixar movie. One of their better ones, in fact. Ah! If the plot was tighter, this would be one of my all-time favorites, but it's still definitely worth your time to check out. Cause you're his when I started working on this video, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit was the movie I was most excited to revisit. Not only had it been a while since I saw it, but it's Wallace and Gromit. How can you not love it? Well, I do love it. The characters are wonderfully charming and entertaining. The animation is really unique and impressive. There's a lot of great jokes. Usually horror parodies make me roll my eyes into the back of my skull, but this movie does it with such finesse and absurdity that I genuinely adore it. The story is very simple, which works well for Wallace and Gromit and allows us to focus on the bottomless pit of charm that is their world. The ending dogfight is so hilarious and so inventive that I could watch it over and over. I like the villain, I think he's hysterical as well. I don't even know what else to say, it's just genuinely great. It earned its win and I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Okay, let's get this out of the way. There. Now that that's out of our system, I really love Coco. I've talked about it semi-extensively in the past, and all the flaws I mentioned in my Moana vs. Coco video still hold up, to the point where I can literally just play that part again for y'all. But it has story flaws here and there, a lack of real tension for a fair portion of the movie, it rehashes a lot of elements from previous Pixar movies, and I don't think it's all that funny, which is kinda shocking for Pixar. Honestly though, these flaws kinda pale in comparison to the absolute sense of wonder and awe this movie creates. I love the characters, I love the songs, I love how thoroughly engrossed in Mexican culture this entire story is. It's just gorgeous. Miguel is like Russell, but better. He's not annoying, and he has determination towards a goal a lot of us can relate to. Following your dreams, despite having to overcome a lot of pushback from the people closest to him. I love his dynamic with Hector. I love how adamant he is to prove himself as a musician. I love how the big reveal is handled with that fade out of the sepia tone flashback, making way for a hard cut to the dim green light of a dark revelation. It's so good. Honestly, you know what my biggest problem with this movie is, when Dante found them in the pit and Miguel got all excited, Dante, being the dope that he is, should have accidentally fallen in. Then after a few seconds of shocked looks from Miguel and Hector, that's when Imelda and her cat dragon show up. That would have been the funniest thing to ever happen in a movie for all time, and it reeks of mispotential as it currently is. But that's what's great about Coco. Despite its problems, the good elements are really some of the best parts of any Pixar movie. The complex, interwoven backstory of the family holds up so well on rewatches, the characters and their journeys are incredibly endearing, and this has, without a doubt, the best ending of any Pixar movie. Hell, you know what? Any movie on this list as well. The emotional climax and the ending song are just some of the most magical experiences I've ever seen in a movie. But I think what gets me the most is that shot of Hector walking on the bridge, now wearing shoes for the first time in the film because he's been welcomed back into the family of shoemakers. And the look of sheer joy and relief on his face is an expression for the ages. I will never not cry when I see it. So the big question is, did this movie deserve its Oscar win over the boss baby? I've never been so humiliated in all my life! <laughs> That's a tough one, honestly. I'll have to get back to you on that. WALL-E is way better than I remember it being as a kid. It's honestly stunning how well this movie works, despite its massive shift in setting and tone about halfway through. The first part on Earth is as immersive and magical as movies get, with WALL-E going about his day, enjoying Hello Dolly, falling in love with Eve, keeping her safe, etc. Pixar really mastered wordless storytelling in this section, it's truly phenomenal. And the fact that these two characters are so expressive and filled with personality, despite being robots who can barely talk, just blows my mind. The second half, while overall not as magical as the first, still has its spectacular moments. Seeing Eve realize she has feelings for Wally is beautiful. Seeing them dance throughout the vast purple ocean of space is beautiful. The environmental message is really well handled and developed, unlike some other movies. The captain is a really sympathetic character. And overall, it's a tense, exciting adventure. The only real problem I have with this movie is the villain. I said in my Twist Villains video that Otto is just a reflection of the ignorance of the humans who ruined the Earth 700 years ago, and that that ignorance was the true main antagonist, but Otto himself could have been more interesting. 
He could have had some sort of internal conflict about humanity returning and trying to fight his programming. I don't know. For how well realized and three-dimensional the protagonists are, Otto just kind of feels like an obstacle. There could have been so much more to him, and it deflates the tension in the third act a little bit. But not by much. He's still a great obstacle, and this is still an amazing movie. Definitely deserved its win, even though I also really like Kung Fu Panda. Check it out, and enjoy the magic for yourself. You got Steve in me. Much like Up, Toy Story 3 is almost always ranked based on the power of its emotional conclusion. I love the ending just as much as anyone else. For me, the difference between this movie and Up is the fact that Toy Story 3 is legitimately a fantastic film from beginning to end. People like to rag on this movie for being too similar to the second one. I don't see it. I'm the same guy who thinks A New Hope and The Force Awakens are two tonally distinct movies, despite one copying the other's narrative beats. And it's the same thing here, but less obvious, so I don't have a problem with it. If anything, Toy Story 3 feels like an evolution and a natural progression of two. It's darker, more heartfelt, filled with a lot of tense moments and some great comedy to balance things out. It follows up on the central dilemma of two. What happens when Andy does grow up? I mean, listen to this. Besides, when it all ends, I'll have old Buzz Lightyear to keep me company for infinity and beyond. Whatever happens, at least we'll all be together. For infinity and beyond. Come on, that's great cohesion. I'm also a sucker for prison escapes. I can't help it. There's something so cool about seeing an elaborate plan to bust people out of somewhere coming to fruition. And the plan in this movie is so creative and so entertaining that it's a blast. Lotso is also a phenomenal villain. Again, he's an evolution of Stinky Pete, but this is a case where the follow-up does something better. He's really compelling and maniacal, and I've always considered him one of the most hateable villains in any Disney movie, to the point where I kinda wanted him to die at the end. Like, he got off too easy for sure, let's be real. To wrap up, I'm just really tired of people saying this movie is ruined by the existence of Toy Story 4. It really just goes to show how much people let 3's ending overshadow the rest of the film. 3 has great characters, great jokes, compelling drama, a fantastic villain, and despite its dark tone, it's still a ton of fun. It's a great chapter in an ongoing story that may or may not go down the drain, we'll see very soon. Overall, it's not as good as 2. I mean, that's one of the best sequels ever made. But it deserved its Oscar win, and hell, even its Best Picture nomination, why not? It's a beautiful chapter in the most iconic animated franchise of all time, and I'll definitely be revisiting it more and more in the future. Oh, Alright, time to break out the tier list. You got the good movies, you got the really good movies, and then you got the masterpieces. If you haven't watched these, shame on you. And then you get the big boys. These movies are some of my all-time favorites. They are the reason I love animation and film as a medium. So let's get it started. Ratatouille is an absolute delight of a film. This is hands down the most underrated Pixar movie of all time. Every scene and location is dripping with atmosphere. From the cold isolation of a sewer to the sensory cornucopia of a food cellar. Nearly every frame of this movie expresses such an exquisite feeling of wonder and joy. But aside from the atmosphere, this movie just feels the most sophisticated out of Pixar's entire catalog. It genuinely feels like a smart indie movie made for adults. From the pacing to the dialogue to the humor. That's the magic of Brad Bird's writing. His Pixar movies, even the weaker one, have dialogue that feel like they were written specifically for adults, but can still be followed and enjoyed by children. Most Pixar movies, as good as they are, feel like they were written primarily for kids, with adults also being able to enjoy them. This movie is the inverse. It fully immerses itself in the language of cooking, the rich beauty of Paris, the nature and deconstruction of criticism, and the importance of following your dreams. It seems like a simple message, but the way this movie develops it and represents this theme through multiple characters is just just fantastic. This movie has story structure problems. I mean, Remy doesn't talk for a solid 30 minutes in the movie, and maybe one or two subplots could have been cut to tighten the script a bit. But at the end of the day, I don't even care. This movie absolutely soars due to a wonderfully realized world, great characters, a rich, mature story, and some of my favorite scenes in any film, let alone animated film. I have a soft spot for Persepolis, but of course Ratatouille deserved its Oscar. It's a masterwork that Pixar has not topped since, and I hope more people will really start giving it the respect it deserves. It's such an incredible experience, and you should watch it right after this video is over. Yep, 
it's that good. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse should not even be a real movie. I'm shuddering at the amount of effort it must have taken to craft every inch of this incredible world, brought to life in the most gorgeous style of any animated film I've ever seen. If all 3D animation looked this good, I'd almost be okay with leaving 2D animated films behind forever. Please note I said almost. This movie's fluid, eye-popping visuals which make every character and action beat leap off the screen is honestly just a small piece of the amazing puzzle. I'm not one to lavish gorgeously animated movies of praise if I don't find the story or characters compelling. Fortunately, Spider-Verse swings past this issue with a mature, well-written story that strikes a perfect balance between levity, excitement, genuine heartbreak, and for lack of a better word, magic. This is that rare movie where nearly everything works to an amazing level. I laughed out loud at least a dozen times on my sixth viewing of the movie. The emotional beats choke me up every time. The action is so fast yet so fluid and easy to follow, making for an experience that's enthralling, smart, funny, and unlike any other movie that's ever been made. I bought every single thing about Miles, from his struggle with adapting to a new school and his spider powers, his connection to his dad and uncle, his relationship with Peter B., everything. When he finally masters his powers, it feels like a genuine triumph. It makes me want to get up and cheer in a way that so few movies have ever done. Honestly, I still can't believe this exists. It's just an instant classic, and I have not been able to stop thinking about it. Obviously, it deserved this win. The fact that Ralph Breaks the Internet was in the same category as it is embarrassing. <laughs> Check it out if for some reason you haven't seen it already, because animation this inventive, mature, hysterical, and powerful deserves to be rewarded. I also highly recommend checking out Cinema Win's video on the movie, which highlights so many amazing little details that I could never fully go into. But I did want to mention my personal favorite detail. Not only is Miguel in this movie, but he's the guy who shot at Gwen's dad in her dimension. Now that is attention to detail. Congrats, Spider-Verse, you retroactively made Coco better. Now I can say for sure that it's better than Boss Baby and deserve the Oscar. Thank you and good night. <laughs> This is it, Chief. The peak of computer animation and superhero movies. This is my favorite Pixar movie, and I don't think it's hard to see why. It has one of the smartest scripts I've ever seen in any movie, period. Just like Ratatouille, this is a movie made specifically for adults, with the added bonus of being enjoyable for kids. There is not a second of this movie that feels like it's talking down to its audience. Every scene is conveyed with a striking sense of realism, despite the fantastical superpowers being displayed. Every emotional beat and interaction works. Bob and Helen's struggling marriage is portrayed so realistically, almost uncomfortably so at certain times. There's just so many lines of dialogue in this movie that I want to print out and frame somewhere. I love Edna's rant about capes and how it comes back in the ending. Speaking of which, Syndrome is such a fantastic villain in every way. Campy, hilarious, and kind of pathetic, yet legitimately intimidating at the same time. It's only fitting he gets this movie's most iconic line. And when everyone's super... <laughs> No one will be. I also love how this movie is one of Pixar's most emotional, and it doesn't feel like it's even trying to be. There's no scene like the opening of Up or Finding Nemo, or the end of Toy Story 3 where they try to tug at your heartstrings. You're just taken in by the rich themes and incredibly strong relationships between the family members. It feels effortless, which, again, is the magic of Brad Bird's writing. Dude, I don't even know what else to say. It's just flawless. I'm very passionate about the other two movies it won the Oscar against, in very different ways. But Come on, it's The Incredibles. Every time I watch this movie, it just gets better and better. And I have no qualms calling it my favorite animated movie ever made. Wait, why is it not number one? Let's be honest. You knew what number one was gonna be before you clicked on the video. Spirited Away is not a movie. It is an ethereal, immersive, unforgettable experience that leaves you a changed person by the end. From the moment I first saw this movie, I knew that it was a masterpiece and the best animated film I had ever seen. But for the life of me, I could not figure out why. The plot seems really basic at first, right? Chihiro and her parents find some food. They eat the food. They become pigs. Now she has to get a job cleaning a bathhouse and wacky hijinks ensue. It doesn't seem special on paper, so why was this movie speaking to me in a way that no other movie had before. Well, I think I finally figured it out. So allow me to attempt to describe my feelings about this movie even though words could never really do it justice. Spirited Away is a movie about growth. Chihiro starts the movie out very sheltered and scared of everything. 
But through struggles, hardships, smiles, and tears, she matures into a confident young woman who helps not only herself and her parents, but the people around her. It is through her unwavering compassion that she saves Haru and No Face, setting them both free in the process. Every victory she achieves feels earned because the movie takes its time to establish the perils and wonders of the world she now inhabits. And when I say establish, I don't mean through needless exposition. The movie simply shows us one of the most creative, beautiful, endlessly expressive fictional worlds ever conceived, and moves forward with the confidence that we can pick up the rules of this world as we go along, just like the main character does. This makes for an immersive experience that never talks down to its audience. There is no villain in this movie, just real people with easily understood relationships and emotions. The sheer power this movie can convey through raw simplicity, from Chihiro pulling garbage out of a river spirit, to sitting in a field and breaking down crying as the weight of her situation overwhelms her, to sitting on a train and being overtaken by the serene ripples of the water and the spirits passing by. You know what? Nothing I could ever say could do this movie justice. It's just magic. Pure, unfiltered, real life magic. If you haven't seen it, just watch it, and then you'll realize why no other movie could have topped it on this list. The Incredibles is just barely my favorite animated movie, the one I drop everything to rewatch on the most regular basis, but Spirited Away is the best. There has never been, and probably never will be, anything quite like it. And there's something very special about the only traditionally animated film on this list being the best one of them all. If you want to make something as incredible as Miyazaki or Brad Bird one day, or if you simply want to learn how to make your own videos so you can offer a rebuttal on why Brave and Happy Feet are cinematic masterpieces, there really is no better place to start than Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in design, business, and more. As someone who never paid attention in school, and still doesn't to be honest, I found Skillshare an amazing way to learn all sorts of things due to the short, easily digestible lessons helmed by really engaging instructors. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you. Whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity, or even career, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. I highly recommend Creative Nonfiction, Write Truth with Style with Susan Orlean. It taught me quite a lot about writing, and it's helped me reframe the way I structure my video scripts. But wait a minute, Mr. Shafe, what is this gonna cost me? You ask. Oh ho ho, that's the best part, my friend. Not only is Skillshare are super affordable. I mean, an annual subscription is less than $10 a month. That's pretty great. But the first 500 of my subscribers to use the link in the description will get a two month free trial. Do you hear me? Free for two months. It's right there in the description. Don't dawdle because you think, oh, it's probably taken by now. I won't bother. No, nah, man, there's 500 spots. Go claim yours right now. Join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare right now.